how could the Israelites become enslaved when they were already a free people inside of Egypt? Find out on this episode of Ancient Egypt and the Bible. Today we are going to talk about slavery and the Israelite exodus. If you enjoy these videos, please consider subscribing to this channel. And if you wish to help us out financially, please consider becoming a Patreon member or buying my book, The Ark of the Covenant in its Egyptian Context and Illustrated Journey. Okay, so there is one question that sort of plagues the Israelite narrative. And that is, how could the Israelites have become enslaved when they were already a free people living inside of Egypt. Large groups of people were not normally enslaved in Egypt unless they were taken as a result of war booty, so basically foreign conquest. And the issue is that domestic populations inside of Egypt were never enslaved. This presents a problem for the Exodus narrative, because we have Israelites who were allowed to stay in Egypt suddenly become enslaved by the king. So this is the problem that we are going to address in today's episode. Now, to understand what's going on, we need a little bit of context, a little bit of historical context. At the beginning of the 15th dynasty, which is the 17th century BC, the Hyksos become the de facto rulers of Lower Egypt south to Kuse, which is near Asut. And the name Hyksos comes from the Egyptian phrase that means foreign rulers. And they appear to have been the leadership of a group of Amoritic Semites that settled the Nile Delta during the 11th dynasty. They established their capital at Avaris, and they built a port there called Perunefer that they used to trade Egyptian goods across the Mediterranean. They managed to maintain control over the rest of the country by striking an alliance with the kingdom of Kush. So they divided and conquered. They essentially used their alliance with the Kushites to maintain control over the center of Egypt. So they would apply military pressure from the north while getting their allies in the south to apply military pressure from the south. So that way they were able to squeeze the Thebans from both sides to maintain control over the entire country. And this pressure was enough to extort the Thebans to pay out tribute for a long time. Pretty much the entire 16th dynasty had to pay tribute to the Hyksos because of that military pressure. Well, when the Thebans had had enough of being extorted, they were able to quickly throw off the Kushite kingdom. So they broke that southern military pressure pretty fast. And once they had done that, they could turn their attention to the north to deal with the Hyksos. And several Theban kings at the end of Dynasty 17 tried unsuccessfully to drive out the Hyksos. Uh, second Enrei Tau, the father of Kamosa and Akmos I, sort of led the battle charge, as it were. Now, following the death of Second Enrei Tau, who actually died in battle against the Hyksos, we have Second Enrei Tau's mummy, and it has some very, very gruesome battle scars, including an axe blow to the head. So what looks like happened was Second Enrei Tau fell in battle, was captured by the Hyksos, and then executed with an axe blade. His successor, his son, Kamosa, managed to retake all the land of Egypt, 
except for the city of Avaris. And it wouldn't be until Kamosa's brother takes the throne, King Akmosa I, that the Thebans are able to capture all of Egypt. So it's Akmosa I that captures, finally captures the city of Avaris. Now, we see in the Bible, in Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, that a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. This is really interesting. And it's really interesting because Joseph was a vizier. And viziers tend to serve multiple kings. And not only that, the names of the viziers tend to be known from generation to generation. And the reason why is because the Egyptians maintained legal documents over generations, over rule after rule, reign after reign, dynasty after dynasty. The Egyptians maintained the documents of their predecessors so that those records are shown for, say, you know, land disputes, taxation purposes, and the administration of Egypt needed this. So what this suggests is that this new king that arose over, over Egypt didn't just represent a new ruler to the throne, but a complete change in government. This is the sort of change that you would expect when one government overthrows another. That's really the only circumstance here that would explain how a king would not know a vizier of the previous generations. But some have suggested that the Israelites were enslaved during the Hyksos period, during an earlier transition from the Theban 13th dynasty to the Hyksos 15th dynasty. So essentially they're suggesting that the Israelites became enslaved under the Hyksos. Well, I don't think that's too likely. One reason is because the 13th dynasty was not overthrown. The dynasty withdrew from its capital city of Lisht and returned to its traditional seat of power at Thebes. The Hyksos never really conquered Egypt per se. The local Hyksos princes just sort of woke up one morning and discovered nobody was in charge. So the Hyksos filled a power vacuum that was left by the retreating 13th dynasty. Now, we don't know why the 13th dynasty retreated. We just see that they sort of lost control of not just the Delta, but everywhere else. So something happened where they were unable to maintain their control over the entire country. But even if one could make the case that post-Joseph Israelites were present in Avaris during the 17th century BC, it still seems to me to make little sense for the Hyksos to enslave the Israelites within the walls of their own capital city. Contextually, slavery was done by conquest. The xenophobic Egyptians did not enslave people within their own territories. So the Egyptians didn't just randomly enslave like free populations of Asiatics or Nubians living inside of, say, Thebes or any of the, co any of the territories that they considered Egypt proper. So it makes even less sense to assume that the more cosmopolitan Hyksos would enslave a population of such similarity to their own ethnic culture inside their own capital. 
So what's being suggested is that the Hyksos, who were Amoritic Semites, Asiatic Semites, enslaved a population of Asiatic Semites inside their own capital city. It doesn't make a whit of sense. You know, the Hyksos did view other Semites as being similar to themselves, being like culture, like traditions. So I, I don't see this as being viable. Nevertheless, we have an Egyptian text that explicitly mentions the enslavement of people at Avaris, which is the biography of General Akmosa, son of Abana. Now, there were a lot of people at the beginning of the dynasty 18 named Akmosa. Men and women could be named Akmosa. So it was a very, very popular name. So we have to differentiate between, say, King Akmosa I and General Akmosa, son of Abana. They're two different people. General Akmosa was a general under King Akmosa I and Amenhotep I. In his tomb biography, he mentions that the people of Avaris faced a siege and then captives were taken and enslaved. So we have confirmation that the people of Avaris were enslaved, and importantly, when they were enslaved. And that is at the beginning of Dynasty 18, during the reign of King Akmosa. Excavations at Avaris by Manfred Betok showed that the city put up relatively little resistance to King Akmosa's conquest. So the people were enslaved, but the city itself was not destroyed. This seems to imply that King Akmosa enslavement of the people was a punitive action. It was showing that this was a foreign city of foreigners, and he was treating them as if it was a foreign territory and enslaved the people as though it was a foreign territory and they were foreigners. So he was definitely marking a line in the sand saying, I'm conquering you because you're a foreign city of foreigners, and as a result, you're going to be enslaved. Thus, the conquest of Varus makes the enslavement of the Israelites not only plausible being inducted into slavery through conquest, but this event also sufficiently documents the time of that enslavement to Egypt's New Kingdom period during the reign of Akhmosa I at around 1530 BC. So that explains the enslavement of the Israelites in this particular con context. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you found it informative. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time on Ancient Egypt and the Bible.